In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We have been in Mark chapter 6 for several weeks. Today, we finally come to the end of chapter 6. But don't get too happy. Because there are 17 verses not given to us in the lectionary this year. And the reason for that is that the lectionary writers, like John's version of those 17 verses, much better. And they're going to dice him and splice him, and they're going to give us weekly texts from the Gospel of John, beginning next week all the way to the 23rd of August. So we will have the impact of Mark chapter 6 all the way through almost the end of August, almost the end of August, but uh, as for the actual chapter 6 of Mark, it will end today. So since we're ending that crucial chapter in Mark, is the miracles chapter in Mark, let us review what we've done so far. Chapter 6 begins with Jesus coming home. And he is at home and he is rejected by his own people at home. And he is amazed by their lack of faith. He leaves home and sends his disciples among the villages preaching and teaching and healing. And now we don't hear what happens to the disciples. Because right after sending the disciples out, we are given a very lengthy story of a wicked king, a birthday party, a 12-year-old dancing girl, and the death of John the baptizer. That comes right in between. In the passage today, we get the account from the disciples as they returned of all the things they had done, then 17 verses of a break, which John will pick up next week, and then the ending story with Jesus' healings in Gennesaret. So, uh, let's talk about the passage for today. The disciples come back after preaching and teaching in all the villages of Galilee. And they are like children coming up home after a day full of events. First we did this, and then we did this, and then we did that. And would you believe me this happened, and that happened, and that happened? To the point that Jesus sees the excitement, but also sees the exhaustion. And he says to them, let us go to a quiet place, a desert place, a deserted place. And there we will rest, take a little bit of break, have a little bit of fun and decompress. And then you can tell me the whole story once we get there. We will process a little bit later on. Now you may think, how is a desert going to be a place of rest? Well, if you're in Galilee, you can very well be in a desert and still have a lake right there to go fishing. It's a very interesting topography. And that's what is meant here. A little bit of fishing, a little bit of rest, a lot of talking, a lot of resting, because they have been extremely busy. So they leave for a deserted place in chapter 6. Um, they had no leisure even to eat. But many saw them and began to walk by foot or on foot for many hours arriving ahead of them to the place the crowds guessed they were going to be at. This time of year, everybody goes to Boca. Let us go to Boca, we'll find them there. And lo and behold, by the time Jesus and his disciples arrive at this place of rest, the crowds were already there. Jesus looked at them with exhaustion in his eyes, but in his heart, he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then the passage tells us he teaches them many things. Then we get those 17 verses break in which we will see the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. John will tell us all about that for the next month or so. Then the chapter ends with the account of all the healings in Gennesaret. Uh, people were bringing their sick, laying them on mats in the marketplaces. Jesus was coming around, healing them, etc., etc. We have seen consistent themes throughout chapter 6, which are worth highlighting. 
There is contrasts in this gospel, in this past, uh, chapter. Contrasts that Mark wants you to pay attention to. The first contra contra uh, contrast is the faith of the crowds and the faith of those who come to Jesus with acute need. For example, the woman who's healed with a blood dis from a blood disorder, the man whose daughter is raised from the dead, the many that are healed by the disciples and their mission, etc. And Mark compares the faith of those people in need to the Judean authorities who show an impressive lack of faith. They grumble, they doubt, even after they see what they see, they still doubt and grumble. They call him by a derogatory name, the son of Mary, which is as we in America say, the son of etc. That is the same expression. It is an insult, it is not a praise. If you want to praise him, you call the son of Joseph, not the son of Mary, it's an insult. They laugh at him. They, they show hardened hearts, as the passage tells us. Second theme that we see is that Jesus and the disciples encounter multitudes and masses throughout the entire chapter. They are ill, poor, desperate, like sheep without a shepherd, which means they're terrified, lost, insecure, hungry, wandering in dangerous territories. We see, for example, the village people, the disciples heal and teach. The 5,000 hungry people, angry and hungry people in a deserted place. The crowds who give chase from village to village trying to find Jesus. The many who lay their sick on mats in the marketplaces. Third, Jesus shows impressive signs and wonders throughout this section. Right before this chapter, but part of the same section, he cured a woman who had been ill for 12 years. He raises a small child from dead. In chapter 6, he feeds 5,000 hungry people. He walks on water. He calms stormy winds with a command. He heals many sick people throughout the region. So all of these uh, themes that are common to the entire chapter 6. But I believe the center of the entire chapter falls on verse 34. And this is very common of Mark. He gives you 50 verses, and sometimes you miss the, you miss the, the verse 26, 27, 28, uh, and you just pass it by it. But if you go back to it, you see that that is the very center of the entire passage. It's called a chiastic structure. The very center is what provides the meaning for the entire chapter, but you're likely to miss it if you don't pay attention to it. Verse 34 reads the following way. As he went ashore, and it's given to us today, as he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. He had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. That is the very center. This expression, sheep without a shepherd, must be understood in light of the Herod Antipas episode that we talked about last week. The readers of Mark most likely associated this expression with the many Old Testament passages in which this same expression shows up as a criticism against the kings and the nobles of the day for not being good shepherds of the people of God, of the nation. Let me just give you a few examples. Ezekiel 34 passes severe judgment on the leaders of Israel. You shepherds of Israel, you have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You have not strengthened the weak. You have not healed the sick. You have not bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strayed. You have not sought the lost. But with force and harshness, you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And once scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. Ezekiel chapter 40, 11 then prophesies that God himself will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them 
home in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. We see in Jeremiah chapter 12, and also in the passage we read today from Jeremiah chapter 23, we read, the prophet says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. It is you who have scattered my flock, have driven them away. You have not attended to them. So I myself will gather the remnant. I will bring them back to their fault. They will be fruitful and multiply. Fruitful and multiply. Where have we heard that? Twice in Genesis. At creation, God creates male and female and said, be fruitful and multiply. Also in Genesis, God says this to Noah and his descendants after the flood, be fruitful and multiply. An indication here that God is going to create through his Messiah a new creation. They shall fear no longer. They will be dismayed no longer, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. In Mark chapter 6, we see Jesus of Nazareth feeding the sheep, healing the sick, taking them to safety in troubled waters, leading them in troubled waters, tending to the brokenhearted, etc. Almost all of these images from the Old Testament are fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth in Mark chapter 6. The message of Mark is that Jesus is the promised good shepherd that came to do the work Herod Antipas and the other shepherds, whether Babylonians or, or Greeks or Romans, etc. What Herod Antipas and the other shepherds of the nation have failed to do for generations. Throughout the history of Israel, the kings and those in authority were always seen as overseers or shepherds of the nation. It was their job to ensure public safety, proper worship of the one God of Israel, fair trade, impartial courts, and the protection of the disenfranchised, by which they meant four categories of people, the widows, the orphans, the poor, and the aliens in their midst. It was the duty of the kings to protect all of these things. In fact, in the books of Genesis, we see after a king dies, either one of two expressions. He did evil in the sight of the Lord all the days of his life, or he walked in the ways of the Lord all the days of his life. Doing what's evil means failing to ensure proper worship, justice, and care of those who are in need. Sadly, both Antipas, the puppet king of the Romans during the time of Jesus, and also Nero, the despotic emperor of Rome during the time of Mark, have terrorized the community uh, for decades. We know that Nero terrorized the, the Christians in Rome, blaming them for the fire of Rome, all the way to AD 68 when he himself is killed, from 63 to 68, five years of torture and murder and killing the Romans, the, the Christians whom he blames for the burning of Rome. He had no regard for them as people. All these kings of antiquity cared about was power, wealth, comfort, and the adoration of their subjects, which they demanded under the penalty of punishment, punishment that often included torture or death. Mark is placing two types of kings, two types of leaders in front of us at the end of chapter 6. The first group are the historic kings of Israel, Rome, and others. Despotic, abusive, insecure, cruel, power-hungry. These kings demand obedience by all costs. They want the adulation and ador adoration of the crowds when in fact he's, they're not taking care of them. All they want is power for power's sake. On the other hand, Mark presents us 
King Jesus, the descendant of David that has been promised by the prophets, the Son of God who is the true Good Shepherd, the true King who will shepherd the nation with love and kindness, the suffering servant of God who is on the side of humanity. And Mark is telling you all and telling me you must choose one of the two. You can either choose to follow the politicians and the leaders of the day. We can buy into their lifestyle and their worldview. We can advance their causes, even though sometimes their causes dehumanize and subjugate others. We can develop a cult around them. We can buy their merchandise. We can just adore them to the point of no return. Or we can follow King Jesus, placing all our trust and his grace towards us. Now, this doesn't mean that we fail in our civil duty if we follow and love Jesus. No, we have to vote and we, and we have to show some allegiance to some party. I understand all of this, but be careful of making a cult out of politicians you follow. The choice is ours and we must choose well because eventually many of us become exactly like the people we follow. If we follow King Jesus, we'll do the things that King Jesus has done. And as a result, we will eventually become more loving, more kind, more forgiving, more generous. We will develop a closer relationship with God in Christ. And as a result, we will develop closer relationships with others, regardless of who they may be. We will become the people God wants us to be. So choose well. Only King Jesus is the true shepherd. I pray that today we will hear the voice of the shepherd and that we will follow whatever he may lead. Amen.